Hello, uh, my name is Lisa LaRonque and I'm the director of the Brazoria County Library System and I want to thank you all for coming to this event. We're very excited to be partnering with Hoopla in this inaugural event for them. Um, when we thank you all for taking time out of your busy schedules to be with us tonight. I'm sure this is going to be a wonderful event. We're expecting great things from this and we are um, wonderful proponents of Hoopla. It's been a great service for our patrons and this is, seems like a really wonderful way to extend the services that they are already providing. So um, I'm going to turn things over now to Mr. West, Thomas West, and he's going to direct the rest of the night. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd like to also mention that we have um, Bakota here, the Bay Area Council on Drugs and Alcohol. Danielle Meyer is here, and she's um, co coalition coordinator for Brazoria County. And we want to thank them for providing information about heroin addiction and recovery. And uh, be, please be sure to stop by their table afterwards and check out all the wonderful information they have. And now I'm turning it over to Hoopla. And Lindsay, it, you're up next. Hi. Okay guys, so um, thank you so much uh, to Lisa and to Tom um, for the welcome and letting us host uh, our first ever book club event here. Um, and I really appreciate all of the staff's efforts um, in planning, I think most especially in bringing Bakoda um, and Danielle in tonight because I think it just gives us a more comprehensive event and hopefully destigmatizes um, the issue that we're here to discuss a little bit. Um, so you probably already know, right? We all know that heroin and opioids are an issue in nearly every community in the US, reaching into Canada um, at an alarming rate. So in 2017, um, set a new record with 72,000 uh, deaths in the United States alone. Um, and in Ohio, where I hail from, we have one of the highest rates, it's double the national average. Um, so Stephanie's book is really, really relevant uh, right now because it approaches the crisis. Um, a belated introduction, I'm Lindsay, I'm the ebook lead for Hoopla and alongside Tara, uh, we curate the Hoopla Book Club. Um, we launched in April and Stephanie's book is our third spotlight, but this is our very first author event, so it's really special. Thank you guys for being here, so excited. Um, if you're not familiar with Hoopla, I'll just give you like a brief uh, overview. Um, for our book club, we pick a spotlight title and eight additional titles each quarter, and those um, are available to you without any weights in ebook or audio, so no matter how you like to enjoy the book, uh, you can do it that way. Um, and then what I think is really cool is we do all the work for you, so the discussion guides, everything like that, um, we take care of it so you don't have to. Um, one resource that we do that I think is really fun is the Book Club Companion, so it shares with you how you might use resources across Hoopla um, to kind of enhance your book club meeting. So this time um, we focused on celebrating Harris, uh, Stephanie's brother, and we picked um, movies and albums by fellow comedians and his friends, um, some recipes we thought he might enjoy from his uh, culinary adventures, right, as you uh, hopefully enjoyed in the book, um, and even his own audiobook, Humble Brag, and a whole lot of fish albums. There's a surprising number of fish albums available on Hoopla, so that was kind of fun. Um, Curating book club titles is hands down my favorite part of the job. It is so fun. Um, I read a ton of books every quarter. Some are scary, some are funny, some are literary feats, some are educational. But there are some that kind of just reach in and they pinch and they poke your heart and your brain in ways that you weren't expecting um, and make you think and feel things that you otherwise might not have. Um, and those are the books that I am most excited to present. Uh, and Stephanie's um, book is one of those. Um, I mentioned that in Ohio, uh, we're particularly affected by the opioid crisis. Um, emergency room visits last year were up 70%. Of all 50 states, we took home the second place for uh, overdose deaths related to our population, which is a pretty terrible, right, silver medal um, to win. <laughs> but this is concerning not just because I live there, but really heartbreaking because in 2013, um, a wonderful 25-year-old man named Matthew Williams was one of those lost. Um, and that was my brother. It was my little brother. He wasn't famous like Harris, um, but he was my personal comedian and my co-conspirator and my best friend. So obviously, I took this book to heart. So on a really much smaller scale, I'm sure, than Stephanie experienced, you know, my brother wasn't famous like Harris, but uh, when he passed, and again and again and again, when we see anyone in the news that is lost to opioids, um, and we regrettably read the comments, we see words like junkie and loser, and words that really, really pinch and they poke super hard. 
Um, and so those words people are using to describe a person, Harris and Matthew, um, they're defining and they're boxing that person in by one bad choice, even though they were so much more uh, and had so much more to contribute. They, like every single one of us, and like the book title, um, are just horrible and they're wonderful and they were figuring it out, right? So thank you for putting any preconceived notions you might have had about addiction um, to be here tonight. That's really important. So thank you for showing up um, as your contribution to Harris and to Stephanie and to families like the Whittles and to mine. Um, what I respected and enjoyed so much about Stephanie's book is that, well, certainly it contributes to the opioid conversation if you're lucky enough not to know a lot about heroin, and you probably learned a couple things, um, right? But it's a book about a person. It's about Harris, and it's about Stephanie's people and her family. Um, it really relatably brought all those people and their grief and their anguish and their humor and their love to life. Um, it what brought everything that was horrible and wonderful about each of them to light. Um, I think her book has really wonderful insights that we can all relate to. We can kind of see um, our family in this book, right? Um, and Harris, her brother's antics, um, and his being that funny golden child, which all of our little brothers are, right? They're always the golden child. Um, and Stephanie being her brother's confidant in her father's letters from Santa. I, Okay, get to that chapter, because it's, it's, it's good. Um, in her husband's kindness and humor, her mom's motivation, and in Iris's innocence. Um, in these things, we see beauty, and we see that beauty, um, and we understand it as something that heroin kind of threatens to take away. Um, so in a desire to better understand that, thousands of people have read Stephanie's book on Hoopla in this quarter alone. It has hundreds of positive reviews, which I hope means people laughed and they cried. Um, but I hope, really, uh, most importantly, that they understood something after reading it, and in that empathetic space of understanding, um, we're here today. So uh, no one person can make a significant dent, right, in this mess alone, not Matthew, not me, not Stephanie, not Harris, um, but with the power of books and the power of Stephanie's book, uh, we can make a difference. We can start the conversation. So in rooms like this, we can make connections. In libraries, right, we can learn um, all about it, and in small, mighty groups, we can chip away at this big, big mess and the sadness. So if you haven't read the book, read it and then recommend it to like 10 people would be good, more is fine also, um, and get those conversations moving along. Um, so let's get our actual discussion and bring the guest of honor up, right? It's gonna be so much more funny and lovely than I am. Um, thank you for writing a heck of a book and putting it out there and for starting our conversation today. Thank you. <laughs> I should go home. You were, s that was so beautiful. Oh my goodness. I'm, wow. Thank you. That was really moving and I am so sorry about your brother. Um, yeah, I, I j I'm always thrown off when I, when I hear that because um, there's so many of us and I'm sure that if you're sitting in this room, you've been touched by this in some way and uh, Every time I hear it, or every time I get a message or an email, and there, this isn't a humble brag, this is real. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of, of messages I get about people who have lost their siblings, or husbands, or brothers, or best friends, or whatever. And uh, it's a problem, and it's very sad, and uh, anyway. Okay, so <laughs> you said it was gonna be fun, so I thought I would just kick it off with a bang here. Um, so, I wanted to kind of, when I thought about what I wanted to talk about tonight, um, I'm sure we're gonna get into the drug epidemic and, and all of the, the things that you mentioned. Um, but I get asked a lot about the process of the book and, and um, why did you decide to write the book and how did you do all, and, and I sort of thought it would be interesting to approach my little spiel for you guys from that angle. Um, and then I'm gonna do a little reading and then leave some time for, for questions. Um, but before I begin, I just, again, want to thank you for having me and for being the first. I feel deeply honored. <laughs> so, so it's a lot of pressure. I'm, I'm, I'm cracking up here a little bit. Um, but thank you. So um, she mentioned Iris. Uh, so everything for me in my life really changed, as it does when you have a child, in 2014 when we welcomed our little girl, Iris. Um, and has, has anybody listened to the book? Is this a, every, okay. 
so half and half kind of a deal? Okay, all right. So some of the stuff you might have heard before if you read the memoir, since I am talking about my life up here. So I'm sorry if I'm being repetitive. Um, but when Iris was born, she was so beautiful. And, and I know everyone says that about their kid, but she was legitimately beautiful. It was a fact. And she really did come out of the womb like this, you know. And she was, it was like she was saying, hello world, I'm in you now. And, uh, and if you've ever looked at my Instagram, she is still saying that uh, to the world with words now, constantly. Um, but, but anyway, so we were, we were elated to, to have her and, and it, was, it was a really wonderful time. And then 24 hours later, she failed her newborn hearing screening. And uh, two weeks later, we were sitting in an audiologist's office, and we were told, as she's hooked up to all these wires and things all over her head, that she had a permanent hearing loss in both of her ears, and that it was going to be forever. There's no cure. And she'd have to wear hearing aids for her entire life. So I'm a new mom. Uh, hormonally insane, bonkers out of my mind, and then this to be dropped on our laps. So needless to say, it was a lot to take in, and I really spiraled into this dark place, what I like to call the darkness, okay? And for the sake of getting on the same page, I'm just going to define it for you so we all know what we're talking about. I'm sure you've been there because you're humans. Um, but it is just this emotional black hole, right? It's, it's empty and lonely and draining, and it just doesn't care that you have to take your kid to school or do any work or do anything. All it wants to do is stay in between the mattress and the covers, that's where it lives. And so I was in that place very, very intensely and it was around that time that my brother came in to meet his niece and he was so excited to meet her, uh, just over the moon and he set up camp on my couch and she slept there on his chest I mean, days, hours, it was just, they were glued together. And I was still reeling from this diagnosis and I really did cry. And I, I'd say it's like I had le just leaking out of my eyes. I just cried the whole visit. And at some point he looked over me like, like only a sibling can do. And he just like looked at me point blank. He's like, you are a mess, you know? I mean, he's just like, this is the most depressed I've ever seen you. Uh, you gotta get over that. You gotta, come on lady, you know, just in his little way of giving me a pep talk. He said, um, because he was so wise and, and he just like got to the center of a matter very quickly. Um, so it's hard to not have him here now because I need someone to do that for me. I need that, but nobody else can get to the center like he can so fast. So he said, you have to realize this is normal for her, right? This is weird for you, this is hard for you, but, it's, but you're not her. And, and, and when she gets those hearing aids, that's gonna be normal too. So. She's just a chill baby, you're the mess. Um, let her be a chill baby and, and don't mess her up, you know, <laughs> with your dark cloud thing. And uh, I was like, okay, whatever. And, um, but you know, he was right because after I sort of like came out of that fog, the first year of her life was spent with all of these delightful things like that you do with babies. Like we just blew bubbles all day long and sang all the songs and, and played in the playground and s swung on swings. And, and um, it, was, it, was a, it was a lovely time. And there's all those major milestones like crawling and walking and mama and dada. And, and then we had her first year speech evaluation that she passed with flying colors. And um, I was afraid she wasn't ever gonna talk. <laughs> which is hilarious uh, because she just doesn't ever stop talking uh, for one moment. And I was telling them I was so excited to drive out here to Pearland. It's an hour from where I live because I just got to be by myself <laughs> in a quiet car. It was such a delight. My mom said, do you want me to come with you? And I was like, nope, I don't. I'm just going to drive by myself. <laughs> Any moms in the room, you know that silence is right. Like, oh, I got to go to this important thing. I can't help with bedtime. Sorry. Um... <laughs> That's why you're all here, right? I'm on to you. <laughs> you just didn't want to do bedtime. Um, so, so anyway, uh, where was I? What was I saying? I got carried away with the being by myself thing. Right, thank you so much. <laughs> I was like, you guys want to go get a drink? No. <laughs> um, we're away from our kids. So anyway, um, so yeah, I was, I was over the moon about it. It was this amazing moment where I was like, okay, all the things that I was afraid of, that I was crying about, that I was in this dark place about, that Harris said to get over, 
he was right. It's, it's fine. She's great. She's better than fine. And uh, that was the day that I was changing her diaper in this public restroom. And as I am changing her diaper after this miraculous session that we had had, I got a call from an unknown LA area code. And I pressed ignore and continued to deal with the diaper. And it rang again. And for anyone who has ever loved anyone who is struggling with drug addiction, you know what that moment feels like. You know what that phone call feels like, and I knew that it was it. I knew that was the call. And it was the one that had haunted me every day for the two years and 18 days since he told me that he was addicted to drugs. And um, I picked up the phone, and the detective told me the news. And it was just like a bomb had just exploded. That's the only way I can describe it. If you've been through that, I'm sure you can relate to that moment. And it just blew up everything. And um, I talk a lot in the book about hitting the ground. I spend a lot of time on the ground. You literally do when you're in that place. You, you fall down a lot. Um, like the weight, I just couldn't hold myself up. And I really metaphorically stayed there on the bathroom floor for a very long time. I woke up the next day, which was my birthday, so I'm forever 34, it's really great. I never aged after that day. Um, and I was crying after waking up. And I, and I remember thinking, how is it possible to awake from a sleep state crying? I was like crying in my sleep or something. And um, over the course of that year, the only thing that kept me going was that little girl, as children do. If you're, st if you're depressed, just have a kid, okay? Just go home and have a kid today. Um, because she forced me to get out of myself. She made, I, the next day, I had to get up and feed her. I had to make sure she still stayed alive. I couldn't just stay in the place between the mattress and the covers because there was a little girl that needed me to be there for her. So, um, at the time, she only napped in the car, as, as one-year-olds do. And so I would spend like hours in the car with this child. And um, I couldn't really be on social media at the time because it was a really painful place to be, seeing people posting pictures of their fun, happy lives. And I was, you know, in a terrible place. And so I would occupy my time by writing all of this stuff down that was in my head. And there was so much of it. And at some point, my husband suggested that I publish some of this stuff online. And uh, did you know you, you can do that? You can publish your feelings and thoughts on the internet. Um, <laughs> and so I did it um, because I was already just so low. It wasn't like I had anything to lose. I wasn't even, I was like, fine, okay, I'll do the internet, whatever. And um, I, I really, it was terrifying and liberating at the same time to be so vulnerable and transparent with the World Wide Web. Um, but I, and I, and I didn't think anybody was gonna read this thing. And I thought maybe my family and friends would read the essay and then they would realize why I wasn't calling them back or answering my phone or taking showers anymore or anything like that. And, um, but instead this really unexpected and kind of magical thing happened where this, you know, the internet can be a terrible place. We all know that. Um, what you talked about, the comment threads right on. I, I have gone to battle many a time with, uh, with the junkie callers and all of that. But in this particular instance, the internet turned into this like weird unicorn where this <laughs> online community of people who had walked a similar path and who had experienced this sort of loss or grief related to any, any loss, any death, addiction and otherwise, just sort of came out of the internet woodwork to share their stories with me. And it was really the first time since my brother had died that I didn't feel so alone. I, I read Joan Didion's book, The Year of Magical Thinking. I inhaled it in like 24 hours, probably less. And I didn't feel so alone then too. I was like, oh, you've experienced this too, although she's from the Upper West Side. She has a very different life than I, than I led. Mm -hmm. So I, I was like, okay, you're you, but I'm not the first person to feel this grief. And I think when you, when you know that other people have lived through something like this, you feel like less of an alien, right? So I, f I found this sense of connection that I didn't even know that I needed until it, it showed up. And it continues to show up with, with people reaching out and sharing their stories with me, which I always love to hear. I mean, in a horrible way. I don't love to hear the terrible stories, but you know what I mean. Um, and so one of the people who reached out happened to be a literary agent. And she said, do you want to turn this into a memoir? And um, 
I was like so out of my mind at that point, but I, I was writing constantly and it was very therapeutic at the time. And, and so I said, all right, I'll keep doing what I'm doing. And then if you want to try to sell that to somebody, you can, but I, but I wasn't concerned with this, like the, this was, I didn't know was going to be what it was. Um, I was just like trying to process all of this. And I was also really afraid of, of forgetting things and forgetting memories and for, you know, cause they're so fleeting. And so I wanted to get it down. And so I would write in real time for the year after he died every day I wrote, I would put the baby to bed and then I would get in my bed and then I would write for three hours, sometimes more. And, um, didn't talk to my husband for that entire year. I'm glad he's still around. Um, <laughs> great guy if you read the book um so yeah and as I was writing unbeknownst to me I started to kind of start to heal I didn't even want to heal because I thought if I did then I would be dishonoring him in some way or I would be forgetting him and and but that's what happens right you start to get better and I started to be able to effortlessly get out of bed without having to pep talk myself I was able to laugh genuinely again. I was able to go to birthday parties and direct plays and do the things that I love to do. And, um, and that was really, really awesome. And after really a year of feeling like I wanted to die, I decided that I wanted to live. And when I, when I say I wanted to live, I wanted to really actually live, which meant doing what I wanted to do with my life. So I quit my job. That was a really good job, but I didn't like it anymore. Um, and I opened a performance space downtown, and I launched a nonprofit, and I published this book. And then in May, we welcomed our baby boy. Thank you. Yes, I should get applause. I'm very tired right now. Um, <laughs> he's very cute. I'll show you pictures later. Um, his name is Harrison. Yes, named after Harris, obviously, and um, we call him Harry. He's very cute. And, uh, but that's, you know, that's really what, what it is. It's that horrible and wonderful thing, and I just feel like life is, if I've learned anything, you know, through this entire weird journey that I've been on to be standing here, it's just this, like, endless cycle of little deaths and rebirths and um, not actual deaths, although obviously those happen too, but really hardship of any kind. And I just really... <laughs> I want to say for anyone out there that agrees is that it's hard to be a person. Uh, it's hard. It's really hard. It's hard to live. And it's hard to experience the process of dying in any way. Um, but I love that you said we're all here in the room together right now. So we're still all doing it despite whatever hardships we may be going through. And so that I think is pretty great. And that sense of community that I was talking about earlier as a result of this book and the book club stuff y'all are doing. I think community is what, what saves us, you know, time and time again. So, to leave you with the wise words of Harris, um, he said, let's stop finding a new witch of the week and burning them at the stake. We're all horrible and wonderful and figuring it out. So, I love that quote. That's where the book title comes from. And um, anyway, that's my, that's my little talk to you guys. Um, I would like to read a little bit, um, if you want to hear it. Um, thank you. <laughs> um, we'll have the cute baby photo session after. Uh, <laughs> yes, or you could just follow me on Instagram, and then all you'll see are pictures of this child. It's like I'm obsessed with him or something. I am. Um, okay, I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to... All right, does this work? Okay. Okay. Um, so I, I, I like this chapter because um, when I talk about how I would write in real time, this is one of those chapters where I remember very distinctly experiencing this during the day and then coming home and being so incensed and like grumbling into the bed, you know, like getting into the pajamas and being like, Rrr. sorry, I'm going to drink, um, and writing this chapter. So I thought it would be interesting to read. Okay. Um, chapter 23, nine months. If you have not read the book, each chapter is time. So it goes forward and also backwards. But this is nine months after my brother passed away. 
It's both an honor and a punishment to be the person in charge of your estate. There's a lot of shit to notarize and fax and scan and fill out and keep track of and document and follow up with and put into piles and file in folders, and I'm terrible at filing. My skill set really ends at making piles. There are just so many things that need to get done in a timely manner. We weave a complicated web in our time here on Earth, and untangling it amounts to copious forms to fill out and battles with fax machines and conversations with customer service reps that go like this. I'm calling because my brother died and I need to close slash cancel fill in the blank. At first, these words were impossible to say. Uttering them made it real, and I would inevitably break down and cry into the phone to a stranger working off of a script. But I've said them so many times now that it's become entirely unemotional. When they say the obligatory, I'm so sorry for your loss, I respond with a quick thanks and scurry on to the reason for my call. I'm certain that they are not sorry for my loss, so it's ever so slightly insulting. Plus, I just want to get on with it. Per the instructions of your business manager, I go to a local Bank of America branch to close out your account. The guy who helps me has spiky, goopy black hair and wears a cheap olive-colored suit that hangs on him oddly. He can't be a day over 23. He is notably fidgety and energetic. It crosses my mind that maybe he just snorted a bump of cocaine off of his house key in the employee bathroom. He's spinning his desk chair back and forth and drumming on the desk with his pen. We could have just as easily been talking about a concert we both attended. The whole conversation feels nauseatingly, all right, banal. Is that how you say that word? Banal? Ban banal? I, every time I get to it, I do this, guys. <laughs> every time. Banal, I'll say banal. I know what it means. I just always stumble on the pronunciation. <laughs> Hi, I wrote this book. Um, <laughs> Anna Reverend. I am here to close my dead brother's bank accounts. He's doing another task at work. Like most instances of closing a deceased person's account, there are numerous unnecessary hoops through which you must jump. I'm convinced that institutions make it hard so you'll just say fuck it and leave all your shit there indefinitely. I was certain I had all the right things. A copy of the trust, an original death certificate, a warm smile, but this doesn't satisfy the needs of our banking institution. The guy calls a 1-800 number and asks the representative to guide him through what I assume must be a very common occurrence. After all, death comes to all of us. He pushes the buttons on his phone with the end of his pen and starts to play with the arm of the office chair as he holds for a representative. When someone picks up, he explains that the account holder died and then looks over at me while covering the receiver of the phone. Are you a sister? One of his sisters? Yes. He spins my driver's license around and around with his fingers on the desk. Oh, really, he says into the phone? Oh my gosh. So do we still have to send it through wealth management or can we just do that letter or whatever? Now he's snapping his fingers. He's literally snapping. He picks up the death certificate and starts reading portions of it out loud to the person on the other end. A letter of instruction or something like that? He starts whistling. I put my hand over my mouth because hateful sentiments are about to exorcist out of me and I'm already late picking up Iris from school. He hangs up with a chipper, thank you very much, have a great day. Turning to me, he says, you have to complete a couple of forms, one for Texas and one for California, and then fax the wealth management department a notarized California small estate affidavit. Where might I find such a document? Google it. I leave with a rage that seeps into the spaces between my bones and stays there for the rest of the day and night. This is how it is. I vacillate between bad days and days where I do a decent job of functioning in the real world. Despite the volcanic rage and profound sorrow that are now part of my cellular makeup, I'm very efficient. I take care of the things that need taking care of. I make jokes, post pictures of my kid online, attend parties, teach students, take daily walks, pulling a little red wagon. I keep up with current events, have opinions, feel and express political outrage. I read the news, listen to This American Life, type emojis and text messages. I throw a housewarming party, direct another play, remember to give birthday gifts to my daughter's teachers. I'm convincing in my role. But when I catch a glimpse of myself in the mirror as I'm washing my face, or brushing my teeth, I see the outline of a mask. I don't look like myself anymore. 
because underneath my skin, I'm miserable. The dumb internet is partially to blame. I see your friends' lives moving on. Proposals, weddings, babies, things for which you would have been there, things you'll never have the chance to do. These are the things that pile up inside of me. And then suddenly, it's 11.30 on a Sunday night, and I'm standing in the bathroom in my underwear and a threadbare t-shirt that Harris used to wear, screaming about how bad it hurts. It comes out messy and guttural. I say fuck a hundred times. I melt into Mike's chest. I feel empty and hung over the next morning like I did when I woke up next to the toilet after my 21st birthday, when I drank too much tequila the night before and lost one of my favorite earrings in the subway. <laughs> This sort of explosion is becoming more rare as time passes, which is fortunate. It takes so much energy that there would be none left. Mostly, I'm learning to live with the feelings. It's all very normal now. I have brown hair. My allergies act up after I drink red wine. I had a little brother for 30 years. Now he's gone. When I do cry, it's quietly with the door closed. I know how to breathe through the sobs, so only silent tears pour down my face. It's not that I don't want to feel the feelings. I don't mind feeling them. In fact, I welcome them. I just don't have anything left to say about them. You're gone, you're never coming back, and it sucks, and it hurts, and it will always hurt, and that's just the way it is now. Thank you. Very weird. We'll never not be weird to read that stuff out loud. <clears throat> Do you want me to scoochie? I'll go here. I'm sorry, I just said scoochie. I have small children. <laughs> okay. Well, well, I do have to say, after finishing this book, you are my age, and my brother is, was your brother's age? And he's doing fine. But there are moments where I was like, ooh. It makes you value those relationships. Yes, and I'm going to see him in a week, so I'm happy. <clears throat> okay, so we have some questions here from all over the country, actually. Mm -hmm. um, the first one is um, from Holly Moore. She doesn't say where she's from, but it says, Is there anything you wish you'd mentioned in the book? Your book helped me through a difficult time. Thank you for your honesty. That's so nice. Um, I think I mentioned it all. <laughs> <laughs> yep, there was no stone unturned. <laughs> uh, truly, I, I had no filter while I was writing the book. Um, and yeah, I think, and I did mention this in the epilogue, I always was concerned as I was writing and after that I would make Harris look bad. Um, Thank you. <laughs> but he, he was and still is and will always be my favorite human being that ever lived or died. And, um, you know, he was really flawed. Like, we all are flawed. And, and it was a book that talked about his flaws after he was gone. You know, so I felt like I always felt um, scared about that and dishonoring him because that was the last thing that I would ever want to do. Um, but when I hear from people like Holly, mm -hmm. and she's like, you help me, then that feels like an accomplishment. It's okay to make him look bad. <laughs> <laughs> it's all part of the human condition, the way I look at it. None yes. of us are perfect. So. Except my husband. <laughs> <laughs> Just in case you're watching. <laughs> um, and another question is from Colleen. And it says, how do you feel about the fact that so many people had and continue to have a relationship with your brother through the years of listening to him on podcasts and watching his work? And what feelings does it bring up when fans talk to him about, about when fans talk about him to you? I love it. I love it. Because, because what happens when somebody dies, um, I'm sure you all agree, is that people stop talking about them at some point. And that is so hurtful because you're walking around with this soundtrack in your head that's just like, they're there all the time. And when people don't acknowledge it, not because they're not nice or because they don't care, it's probably because they don't wanna make you feel bad or you feel uncomfortable, but I'm always like, hey, I'm always thinking about hair. So you can always bring him up to me. You're never gonna ruin my day. 
Um, in fact, I would, I, would, I would appreciate it if he would because he may not be here, but he's always here for us. And um, so I love that he lives on. I feel like I have this really amazing luxury that I get to still have him when I want him. <laughs> like, and I, I was really afraid in the beginning to listen to all of his content. There's so much content. If you want to dive in there, guys, it's a deep, deep pool. Um, there's so many podcasts and episodes and YouTube things, and it's just endless. And he was very prolific online. His voice. And so I can go hear his voice. I remember I was so upset when the phone deleted his last voicemail to me. At some point it just did that. And I was like, no. And then I you know, mourned that loss for a little bit. And then I realized that I could hear him on the computer whenever I wanted to. <laughs> and then the other night a fan sent me, this is so great. This just happened like two days ago. Um, this contraption that they made, somebody made, invented, where you can slip your socks on without having to bend down. Okay, and they were like, um, listen to this clip of Harris doing his phone corner thing like five years ago. He invented this, and so you should sue them. <laughs> and, and so Mike and I listened to it, and it was so funny. He was telling the audience, it was a live show, I think, and he used to do these things called phone corner where he would, he used to write his jokes down. I wrote this terrible tragic book on my iPhone notes app. He used to write jokes on his iPhone notes app. They were much more fun than mine. And um, he would write these jokes that were pretty bad and that would never go anywhere. And they ended up being called phone corner. And on Scott Ackerman's podcast, Comedy Bang Bang, they would, he would read them from his phone and they were all really dumb. <laughs> um, this wasn't a joke though, it was just an idea. And so he was presenting it and he was like, I was just with my sister and she's super pregnant and she can't put her socks on. And so I thought it would be a great idea if somebody invented this contraption where you could just slide your foot in. And he described it, he's like, there's two brackets on either side and you just put the sock over it and then put it on the floor. And I swear, and then that's what it is. So I was so excited. I mean, we got such a good laugh out of it and got good mileage. So I love it. You can always talk to me about Harris. So I will listen. Well, I watched Parks and Rec all weekend before this. So. Yeah. The animal, the animal control episode. Yes. I know. The animal control the episodes are so great. So I do work for a parks department. Oh, you do? Yes. <laughs> is it accurate? It's pretty <laughs> Wow, what do you do in the parks department? Um, reservations and social media. Oh my so gosh. I'm not, I'm not quite in the animal control area. Right. <laughs> um, like the Andy Samberg character where he just yells everything. Yes. Yes. A lot of right. <laughs> That's what he was an outdoor child. The, the Barack Obama joke is just truly like one of the greatest. <laughs> if you're, if he's like, uh, here I wrote the name of a dog, Barack Obama. It's, anyway. <laughs> Um, there's another question here from Bun Jammin. Good, good name. <laughs> now, that the answer, I guess so. <laughs> now that the book has been out for a few months, have you had any unforeseen positives or negatives as a result of putting this out into public? Yeah, the positives are what I told you guys that people are nice sometimes online. Um, <laughs> and the positives have been that I, I, you know, I mean, I love writing. Um, I've always loved writing. It's how I process things. Um, I liked the process of publishing this book. I like um, interacting with people. Um, I like relationships as a human being, so, so some people don't, I do. Um, so that's been really nice, like all the people I've met and the people that I've connected with as a result. Um, the negatives are uh, that some people are the worst, and um, there is a lot of stigma and a lot of uh, judgment around people struggling with addiction. And I say in the book, you know, death, there's hierarchies with death, and drug overdose is bottom of the barrel, so it's not as uh, accepted a form of death as, you know, like cancer or something. <laughs> I mean, it's truly, you know, so you, you get all of that, and I... Um, you know, I've gotten some people saying nasty things, but but in the in I'm sort of immune to it at this point. It's fine. 
I mean, I'm trying to take time away from Twitter because I was getting a little like, aggro and <laughs> I have a baby, so I'd like to be less angry as a human being. <laughs> <laughs> And there's one more question from Middlebury, Indiana Library. And it says, she, they say, I would love to know if there's a specific memory or aspect of your brother that you would share with your children. And she also says, I lost a younger sister many years ago. And when new people can't come into our family and we talk about her, we have a two to three specific things we share with them to understand who she was and what she meant to us. I am always curious about how families keep their loved ones alive for those who never got to know them or meet them. Thank you. Wow, that is such a good question. That's they obviously thought about this. So good. Uh, and I could go on about this question forever. Um, yeah. we, we, I talk a lot in the book, we're surrounded by Harris. All of his stuff is in our house. We didn't throw it away. We kept it. It's everywhere. My son's room in his nursery, there is a... When I say giant, it's giant. It like fills a whole IKEA shelf. It's this giant wooden canvas with Harris's portrait painted on it, and I put it in my kids' room. Is that weird? Maybe. Um, but I want him to be in there with my son because he's not ever going to be able to meet him. And so there are pictures of him everywhere. There are pieces of art that people have sent me everywhere. Um, we, I wrote a piece last yard site, um, which is the Jewish anniversary of somebody's death, and we were lighting the candle, and my daughter was like, what are you doing, and whose birthday is it? And we had to explain the death, and she had no idea that he had died, because we talk about him so much that when I said, "He's Uncle Harris is dead, it, she was just learning it, because when you think about it, I mean, if you're three or four and you hear about this person all the time, you don't think that they're not around. So he's always kept in our, in our conversations. Um, we had this really lovely moment the other day where every day she decides she wants to be something different and she really struggles with it. You know, like she wants to be a veterinarian, but then she wanted to be a zookeeper. So then today we had to decide, well, you could be a veterinarian at the zoo and then that would sort of fix that. <laughs> College for both, and you know, you have, it's like she's really stressed about it. She's four. She's like, um, I really want to be a cowgirl, and I really, you know, and it's like, well, we could do some cowgirl stuff around the vet thing. You know, we're trying to negotiate it. And then she said the other day when we were going to dance class that she wanted to be a rock star because she is listening to Katy Perry obsessively lately. We got her one of those Echo things for her room for Hanukkah, and so she sets her alarm for Katy, to Katy Perry in the morning and. The roar song she really likes, um, as all four year do, and I like it too. Um, it's a really good song. So, um, anyway, she was like, I want to be a rock star, and I got to tell her that Harris was a rock star, that he played the drums because she didn't know that about him. And then I got to play for her on the way to dance. I was like, Do you want to hear his music? And so I played for her the, my favorite Jump Stopper World Die song because he was a drummer in a band. And she like loved it and rocked out to it and had this great moment singing to it. So I just think, you know, it's never ending. I mean, you know, he likes to melt string cheese and eat it from the microwave. We still do that. <laughs> you know? They're just weird things. Um, but yeah, I, I think that's great. And and um, I'm just I'm never worried about keeping him alive. I think he will be kept alive. Yeah, I'd say so. Hard to keep a good man down. That's right. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> and one last um, Twitter question was, um, the hardest part about writing this beautiful book? Also a complicated question, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> living, and I, I think I responded to that when I said living through right. this experience. I mean, I wrote, I wrote the, the final product is very close to what the original first draft was. There was okay. not, um, the only thing that changed really was I submitted like 55,000 words and the editor was like, I need 62,000. And I was like, well, you're gonna have to write them yourself because <laughs> uh, I'm this done here and <laughs> said all the things I wanna say. And, um, and then she was such a great editor that by the time I was finished responding to all of her notes 
of which there were many, I had gotten up to 67,000 votes. <laughs> so she was really good at her job because I was like, no! Um, and yet, um, but um, yeah, the, the reason I mention that is because everything that you read in the book, that torturous, gut-wrenching stuff, it was happening. So the hardest part was that. Mm. Writing it down was how I felt like I could breathe. I mean, that was really like how I didn't drop dead. You know, I mean, I just was like, I, there was not enough therapy in the world for what I need. I was in therapy like so much and it still was like only three hours a week. What am I supposed to do the other 160 hours? Mm -hmm. So, you know, writing was really like a savior for me during that time. Um, Well, that's good to hear. Yes. Because <laughs> sometimes when I'm reading things like this, I've read a couple of other, um, what I call grief memoirs. Have you? Yeah, and that's I don't know why. Book of choice. <laughs> well, not always. I like to balance things out. You also I, like Parks and Rec, so that's, yes. yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I've often wondered, does this hurt or does it help both? So I'm glad to know that it helps. And I assume that yeah. it helps because the people, it's a common thing. Well, yeah, I don't think you can feel any worse. When you're writing a grief memoir, mm -hmm. like I think you feel so bad that you can't feel any worse. So it's not like, like I wouldn't say writing it down made me feel better, cause not, but it didn't make me feel worse, okay. you know? Um, <laughs> that's kind of as positive. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, and, and, and there also is something like really therapeutic about the process of writing a memoir is that you're remembering. And so, mm -hmm it really addressed my biggest fear, which is that I was gonna forget him. And now it gave me like a written record, like I need to remember this family memory in this event, and I need to remember what he was wearing this day, and what he said to me at that moment, and, and it forced me to do that. Now, the editing part probably <laughs> was sucky, because, I mean, not probably, it was, because <laughs> I, because at that point, like t so much time passes, that you're in a different place. And so there was a fee there was a risk that I was gonna change stuff and kind of water down. Mm -hmm. I was afraid of that. And I wanted to just keep it very how it was. But I was I, as I was reading the book, um, when I was less angry, because I, I wasn't less sad, I was less angry. I was like, oh gosh, this is so I'm so angry here. And I sounds so mean and horrible to him. And I was like, okay, but I can't change that because that is how I felt. And when you're dealing with somebody that's struggling with addiction, anger is a real part of that. It is a huge part of it. And, um, but I guess I just hadn't realized how angry I was until I read the book. And I was like, ooh. <laughs> and then I just felt really sad for us <laughs> when I read it. I was like, you know, this was a, hard thing to live through and sorry. Well, I think no matter what happens in your life, there's gonna be something that tests you in this way. Many times. And yes, over and over again because that's part of living. Yes. But it's where you can find the joy in between. Yeah. I agree. And learn. Yeah, I mean I mean like I always talk about the darkness, I joke about it. It's funny. Um, but like, I do feel like whenever you go through those really dark, terrible, tragic, brutal, excruciating times, mm -hmm. you do have growth. There, yes. there is like a profound growth that happens as a result of it. So, um, you know, <coughs> going through all that stuff. I mean, I wrote a book. I. Right. I changed my entire life. You know, it's like you end up taking stock of things after tragedy starts. <coughs> you're like, okay, well, you know, we're here for this long, and I'm gonna need to make it count because you, it can be over at any moment. And then you get this awareness of how fleeting it is, and you're doing well. Last. Yeah, sort of positive existentialism. I found yes. <laughs> nothing matters. Do what you want. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. <laughs> and I, I do want to say um, I enjoyed how candid it was. How I like how you write, 
and that it, it felt like everything was happening to me at that moment, even though I put myself into a book a lot, so I found myself crying a lot, but in a, I don't know, in like a pure way, maybe? Yeah. I don't know. Catharsis. Yeah. Yes, yes, catharsis. Um, so yes, I laughed a lot, too. Yeah. yeah. The blowing of 0.28, I scream laughed when, well, it took me a while to get it, because I was driving. <laughs> <laughs> That is so funny that that is the joke that you just said, because that is my favorite joke of this. I just said that the other day. You're like, what did you want? Okay, it's a joke that um, when I when I recovered his phone, he had like all of the jokes in his set list on his notes app. So one of them, which is my very favorite, is I just blew a, a point two eight. His name was Frank. Because <laughs> so it's like breathalyzer, but that's anyway. Yep. <laughs> I'm not gonna unpack that for you guys. <laughs> Figure it out. <laughs> but that is my favorite joke of his ever. I, every time, every time I hear it, I laugh. Out loud. <laughs> How bad is Frank? Is this on ten? A point to it. Sorry, Frank. <laughs> Did any of y'all here today have a question? Questions? More kind of like a writing publishing question. Um, so you have, a, I'm guessing your maiden name and your married name both. Yes. Mm -hmm. Where, how did you decide to do that? Or do you go by that on a regular basis? That's my name. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've been married a year and a half and all my stuff that I have published is under my maiden name. Yeah. So I haven't changed it. Right, right. I can't decide for sure. I feel you. I was also just talking to another lady about we're just talking about all sorts of things that are the same. Yeah, I was talking, we had a long conversation about that this week. Um, I went, yeah, I went back and forth about it and because Whittles is very much tied into my identity and I also have this other career as an anime voiceover actor. So if you ever Google Stephanie Whittles, um, it's like 20 pages of just anime Weird fans. <laughs> Sorry if you like anime. I don't mean that in a derogatory way. Um, it's just true. Um, so I don't know. I, I just was like, okay, the kid thing. And now it really doesn't matter because you know a lot of people keep their maiden name. And probably honestly, if I had it to do over again, I probably would just keep it Stephanie Wills. But since it's already how it is, um, I, I embrace it. I love it. Um, but so I did wonder, like, should I publish it under my maiden name? But when I started publishing my stuff on Medium, I was already married and I was already using that name. If I had been publishing stuff prior, then I probably would go with my maiden name. In fact, one of my very best friends is um, Jennifer Mathieu, who is a YA mm -hmm. author. She wrote this book, Moxie. Everybody should read it. It's super great. It just was optioned by Amy Poehler. Um, but anyway, she writes under, if she's watching this, hello. Um, <laughs> she writes under Jennifer Mathieu because that was her maiden name and she had always been writing. So when she got married, she it didn't make any sense. So like basically the long answer to your short question is, if you've already been writing under one name, keep it. If you haven't, don't. <laughs> If I get married again, I will keep my writing under Mike's name. <laughs> yeah. Um, where I'm from Dakota, that's here, and I just, um, we know from research that people either going to recovery or thinking about recovery, personal stories and sharing is one of, it's so important in people in recovery. So thank you for putting your life out there, it is, you open to judgment, like you said, you open to good and bad, but for people in recovery, it's very important to hear your story. Um, that's the professional side. Mm -hmm. Personally, um, I listened to your book as we partnered with this. It had been the first time I listened to a book in eons, and you inspired me to go into Hoopla and download so many books I got kicked into next month. <laughs> and, and, you know, honestly, how you read your book and how you, because 
you know, you can have, you can write a book, but you can't always say talk, talk your book. <laughs> Yeah, and you did it so well that it inspired me to keep going. And matter of fact, the reason I jumped to the next month because so many people are like, oh, you don't read it like her. Oh, you're not reading as well. Oh, you're not reading as well. <laughs> so, so you do. I mean, fantastic. That's so nice of you. On the say. audio side, I mean, I fantastic. Really you really. I, this is my boss, and she would park and continue to listen <laughs> because <laughs> we just have. A and room. I listen to a lot of audio books. And oh, I, I hope so. But, <laughs> in my car at home waiting until I got to a point where I wanted to turn it off to go inside. I, I did that so much. And, so nice. um, and it has to do with how you yeah. read it too. I mean your words are one thing but how you read it was just so honest as well and, and you could feel yes, yeah. that. So, thank you. Emotion. So very, very well. Lots of tears, lots of laughter. Yeah. yeah. It was it was rough to record yeah. it. Um, um, because like I said, so thank you, Anime. You helped me. <laughs> um, but I mean, yeah, I do. I do have a performance background. I, I was trained as a theater artist. I have a theater downtown. That's what I, I act and direct as, as a profession that pays me nothing. So I'm not even going to call it a profession, guys. I'm gonna call it a hobby. Um, um, please support the arts. Is what I'm saying to you. Um, but yeah, I, when I was thinking about doing it, I had this pit in my stomach about it, and there were moments where it was just me and an engineer in a room for like a week. I flew to LA, and, and we actually had scheduled five days, but we finished it in two and a half. And um, there were moments when I had to stop, and then sob, and then when you sob, your voice sounds weird, so then I had to take a break and get it back. And so it was, it was, a, it was weird to do that. To but, feel those emotions again. Yeah. At yeah. a different point. In, yeah. In your yes. Life. And that's exactly. one thing that I said when we talked about it at work was for those that have lost a loved one to this, that process of your grief yeah. was, it was right on. I mean, you know, it really was, it was, it was good. <laughs> <laughs> it was real grief. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Have you thought about either writing another book or taking this book and putting it into some type of a performance stage thing or and do anything <laughs> anything different or an evolution of it? Um I'm or is it much like, done I with this book? <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean I I I talk I've been doing some speaking things that I really like to do. Um, um where I just talk about, you know, just themes, I guess, related to, to the book. But, um, and then I always joke, like, I hope I don't write another book because I seem to only be able to write when things are really bad and I would prefer that they not be really bad. Again, um, I, I would like to be able to write fiction. I don't know if I can. I don't think it's my, uh, it's my, it's my medium. Um, but the short answer, do you like how I categorize the short answer or the long answer? The short answer is that I didn't mean to write this book um, at all. It wrote itself. I'm gonna give myself some credit. I was there. Um, but it really did like organically happen. And so I don't know. Maybe another organic thing will happen and I would love to do that again. But right now, um, you know, I have a baby. Yeah. It's like very needy. <laughs> when you were writing it, were you typing it on your phone? A lot or of were time you typing I was it at the computer or vice versa. Uh, all all of it. I was um, a lot of it was on my phone. Yeah, I wrote a lot of this book on my phone. Yes. And then I would transfer that to the computer and then edit that. Um, <laughs> Google Drive, uh, Google Docs has been a real asset <laughs> to the world of writing because you can access the document from anywhere it's amazing um so yeah i would like to write another book maybe something for your kids i do have some ideas <laughs> I have some children's book ideas but but um, my publisher says those are like the hardest things to yeah. get going see i don't know anything about publishing this is why this is also a really great experience because 
I know about theater, because that's what I know, but I didn't know about publishing. So everything that happened, I was just like, oh, okay, this is what happens now, great. Or this one, okay. <laughs> I mean, it was like this very, I didn't have any experience with publishing. So it was a pleasant experience where maybe if you have it, or if you are an author already, it might be like a more taxing situation. Hi. Hi. Um, since your brother was in, um, you know, a show, has anyone approached you to maybe make a, a movie? Yep. Oh. Okay. <laughs> and I said no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. It's that's a weird thing. There's been a couple of those, and I, I'm always open to having a conversation with anybody, you know, but. Um, it's a tricky thing. It's like, it's really hard to not make that story, I feel like, really melodramatic. And there's been those movies made, those, you know, like, heroin movies, and I just don't want to boil his life down to that, because that was a very short period of his life. His entire life was much more than that, and so, um, I'm really protective of it, and I feel like it could get really bad really fast if it was in the wrong hands. So, I mean, I'm an artist. I believe that there are artists in the world that are great at what they do, and so I'm always willing to, to hear, like, if somebody has a good idea, but I think it would have to be, like, just, like, the greatest, <laughs> most experimental and innovative way to tell the story without it coming across if it's musical. icky. Yeah. Fish I don't really want to see that. <laughs> I don't like fish. <laughs> At all. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Oh, yes. Sorry. Okay. Yes. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, so I was talking to a buddy, I'm a big comedy fan, and that's how I came to Paris. Uh, and also, he had like a line on a podcast once where, like, you know, I, there's funny people everywhere, and we just live here. And I think if you're into comedy, Houston is not the center of comedy. Right. You know? Really? If, <laughs> I, mean, I have no idea. If it wasn't for Des Moines, man. <laughs> but uh, but I think uh, one of the uh, one of my friends who I was talking about, like well, when news broke about it, I texted him and I deactivated my Facebook because I was like, I just got to think, like, and that's like something you do. And what I texted him was, did you hear about Harris? Like. Right. Like I knew him, and I was like, why would I? Right. But that sort of doesn't make sense. But so much about him was he just gave everything, including like the the phone phone corner. Like <laughs> comics don't want you to see their B material, let alone their you know D material. How the sausage gets made. <laughs> yeah. Right. And he yeah. and and his <laughs> and your brother sausage. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, sorry, I have to interject for one moment. Um, one thing that I did not put in the book, I don't believe, is that when I ended up downloading all of the stuff off of his phone, my iPhoto library now um, is baby picture, baby picture, Harris the sausage, baby picture. <laughs> I'm sorry, guys. We did a lot of um, online dating. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, he also put it in a book. It's in Sarah Silverman's book, so. Uh, uh, but yeah, anyway, carry on. <laughs> Your brother just showed a lot of himself. Yes, he did. <laughs> no, no, but seriously, that was just like such a uh, old thing. Because, yeah. I don't know, that's like, yeah, we're all, you yeah. know, wonderful and terrible. Right. Uh, often at the same time. Like, well, yeah. I, mean, and, I don't know, that I got from him, and I'm so much better for that. Thank so, you. Yeah. That was so mm -hmm. nice of you to say. And I was actually going to respond to what you were saying about me putting it out there. Harris did that more. I mean, he, he shared about his addiction. If you want to go listen to, to the Pete Holmes podcast that he did, it's a two hour podcast where he is being so candid about his struggles. Um, 
by the time that podcast aired, he unfortunately had already relapsed, and so people didn't know that part of it when it aired. And um, I did as I listened to it and was really furious with him because he was saying a lot of really lovely things that were no longer true. But that's part of the disease. Um, but yeah, I think that that is why people talk about him so much still in the, because they feel like an enemy. Because he was really honest and open. Do you guys write similar? Like, I, I think about it sort of like that sort of everything. Like, I was glad you put the parts that are frustrating about it. Oh. Like, that, and, yeah. you know, because that is, I mean, that's certainly everything that he wrote. Right. Like, and he almost joked that, like, he would have, like, that's, but there's still, like, something there, you know? Like, <laughs> it's just, like, really, it's fantastic, you know, sausage. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs>